As you know, the subject of this series is the philosophy of history. And we have set it within the framework of the cycle of the phoenix, a cyclic pattern recognized by antiquity and more or less justified by modern thinking. We may not be prepared to explain why history breaks so conveniently into 600 year patterns. But we know this to be the case. And we realize also that within these patterns, certain processes continually repeat themselves. Each time on a higher level, each time resulting in a powerful advance of the human estate. Nevertheless, as we measure the life of the individual, so we measure event patterns. And last week we considered, in general, the descent of this cycle over a considerable period of time and gave special attention to that critical point uh, which arose about B.C. 600. This was the beginning of what may be termed the Greek cultural period in the West. And from Pythagoras to the final collapse of Greek civilization, we have a cycle of approximately 600 years. For our purposes, we may begin with Pythagoras and the original Greek sophists, men of the caliber of Thales and Solon. And we bring the cycle to the close with the corruption of Greek civilization as a result of the dominance of the Roman Empire. Thus we have a pattern which leads through the glory of the age of Pericles to that inevitable age or advancement toward ultimate exhaustion of resource which marks the collapse of a culture. Before, however, we go directly to our next cyclic point, which is the beginning of the Christian era, it is more or less a duty to unfold somewhat further the philosophical aspects of history with special reference to the period leading up to the beginning of the Christian era. Factually and actually, history may be said to begin, at least for Western man, with the Christian viewpoint. We have no record that the Greek was an historian, nor was the Egyptian, nor the Chinese or Hindu of that period. History as we know it today did not exist, but there were certain instruments which we may generally regard as historical. Perhaps the most common of these ancient instruments was called the annal. And this very largely distinguished the Greek and Roman historical approach. An annal was a record of an era, a time, a dynasty, or perhaps merely of a family. An annal was therefore in China the record of a reign sequence, that is, the descent of a dynasty, such as the Ming or the Tang or the Han or the Wei. Historians, perhaps to increase their own favor or to uh, find a framework upon which to build a romantic literary production, found it profitable to glorify dominant families and to cater to the hero-loving instinct of their people. The animal, therefore, was not history in the broad sense, but a small exclusive document. Into this document might be drawn occasionally some external circumstance or incident.
but only in the terms that that incident was directly related to the principal concept or the principal purpose of the animal. The animal descended later into the medieval period of Christianity as the chronicle. The chronicle being a kind of fabulous account of things. Lacking, however, the essential ingredient of history, namely connective tissue. History only began formally when man began to ask the effect of the past upon his own time and the probable extension of both past and present into the future in which his children must live. This is what we call historical perspective. It did not exist. Each episode stood alone in ancient times. The moral implications, the ethical overtones, the spiritual imponderables, were almost completely ignored. Now, to a degree, this is due to the peculiar development of the historical instinct in man himself. And now in the 20th century, we realize that actually we are reliving most of the ancient cycles of world advancement. Let us analyze our present situation. What we call history today is for the average layman merely an annal or a chronicle. We mean by that that if someone says history, we do not immediately have a picture of the interdependencies of times and nations and races and religions and doctrines. We merely think of history, for the most part at least, as the descent of European culture. If you ask the average person who has a so-called adequate education today to name you the first emperor of China or the first emperor of Japan or to date for you any of the important in East Indian historical incidents, he cannot do it. He cannot do it because he has not approached history except in the terms of its direct relationship upon the way of life in which he now lives. Today for us, history is primarily American history. And our emphasis outside of this is upon the circumstances which led up to American history, the relationships between the growth of the American historical pattern and that of surrounding states, the effect of other nations upon America, or perhaps to a measure, the effect of America upon other nations. But our point of view is essentially provincial, our own. And outside of this point of view, we have an instinctive inclination to depreciate the cultural existence of other peoples. Perhaps we f frankly acknowledge that we do not know much about these subjects. Consider, for example, our knowledge of literature. We are well read, for the most part, in European and American literature, comparatively illiterate in the literature of any other people. Our only real source of ancient literature is the Greek or Roman complex. Today we can quote perhaps an occasional line from Homer, or perhaps meditate upon some wisdom of Cicero. But we cannot quote a line from the Zenda Vesta. We cannot quote a line from the Tables of Sargon. Yet these other documents are in terms of holistic history just important, just as important as anything that we have recorded. It is simply that we are still largely in the era of the annals. To us, the story of history is the story of how we arrived at our present situation. And while this remains, we cannot be said to have an essential or sound philosophy of history. Somewhere in this pattern, we realize that the prejudiced historian must always fail and any group of historical project 
which receive the supreme prejudice of national emphasis must, to a measure, prove unsound. Here we have the greatest temptation to distort, to protect and preserve the appearance of our own virtues, and to sacrifice, if necessary, other factors which are outside of the auric field of our historical intent. Thus we advance ourselves at the expense of others, and have therefore for centuries laid no foundation for our great need today, namely a one-world concept. We are unable to cope with it, simply because we have never been prepared for any such emergency. Yet in this world, there is a history in and of itself. History stands as a complete structure, independent of any nation, independent of any culture, for it is actually the record of the growth of man as a total being. Each generation can find itself in history. But no historical work which is limited by the perspective of generations can be truly history. This is the great deficiency which we find uh, not only in our own perspective, but for the most part in the historical point of view of the ages which have preceded us. Thus we today have some popular histories that attempt an international viewpoint such as the work of H.G. Wells. But unfortunately, we have not given the reading of these works a proper consideration <coughs> due to the lack of preparedness in our own consciousness. We have come out of all kinds of historical reading with certain emphases, certain glamorized episodes, but we have not a truly historical perspective. Again, in the 19th century through literature, and in the 20th century through the medium of motion pictures and television, we have gradually come under a, another false historical point of view. We have developed what might be termed the heroic complex. We have taken individuals out of history dramatized them, frequently misrepresented them totally in order to compromise with the requirements of entertainment. We therefore produce pseudo-historical documents, which in themselves are a serious detriment to history, because they present situations not as they were, but in order to clarify the dramatic point of view of some individual situation or sequence. For instance, recent pictures uh, dealing with great heroic families or outstanding dictators, generals, conquerors, are comparatively worthless simply because the facts are not correct and the historical perspective is totally distorted. A good example of this type of thing can be the average person's concept of the French Revolution. The only thing we think of is the reign of terror. The real perspective of this great struggle, from an historical, sociological point of view, we are unable to appreciate. Our knowledge of the French Revolution is built somewhat upon Dickens' great story of the tale of two cities. Or perhaps our understanding of a certain level of French life is coined uh, from the base metal of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. These things do not tell us historical values. But from them we have created a patch quilt of opinions which we continue to hold and which therefore close our minds to the direct and complete approach to our subject. All the way along, therefore, we have found it necessary to create new historical instruments 
and this is gradually being done. But the accomplishments are for the most part limited to learned journals with a circulation of 500 copies. By the time they are watered down to our common consumption and have been made highly palatable to the reader who studies while he runs, not much is left that has any essential value. The new instruments of history are mostly what we might term below the ground evidence. Below the ground means such monuments, such inscriptions, such excavated material, such reclaiming from ancient ruins and archaeological sites as give us a new way of appraising the value of the classical historian. We have created discovery as a censorship upon tradition. We are no longer satisfied to accept the history given to us by Herodotus. It is no longer necessary for us to study Egypt through Greek and Roman reports. The development of a means of interpretation based upon the discovery of the Rosetta Stone has opened to us 5,000 years of Egyptian records. Little by little, we are escaping from the historical patterns which we once depended upon for orientation. And little by little, we are checking these patterns by more recent discoveries and by an increasing collection of literary, scientific, and anthropological artifacts. As a result, as one observer has noted, we have tumbled nearly all of ancient historians from their august thrones and condemned them by proof as inaccurate, prejudiced, or uninformed. Now this does not mean that we should disregard them, neglect them, or ignore them. But what we must recognize is that they lack two proud facilities which we possess. First, they have no means of general communication and transportation. They were limited inevitably to areas. And much, much of their history came along caravan routes by report and hearsay. They had no other source, no other means of verifying anything except contemporary events in their own areas. The second deficiency that rested very heavily upon the ancient historian was the lack of method or lack of pattern by means of which he was impelled to examine immediate evidence and weigh it. He was impelled only to accept or reject according to his own judgment. Today we do not follow this course. We are in a position to observe the censorship of the past upon the present. We know that certain antecedent causes must have preceded events. This the ancient historian did not know, therefore he did not search for them. We also must realize that every effect having a cause, even the most obvious circumstances in our way of life, may have subtle causes, which he was not in ancient times able to examine or had any incentive to do so. Thus our reports from the past give us a framework against which we must turn modern attention. And with this thought in mind, we will go to one of the most obvious examples of this situation, and that is religious history. Let us think of religious history as we uh, even regard it today. Within the last 200 years, the entire approach uh, for, to history on a religious level has departed from the speculative uh, thoughts and procedures of the Scottish metaphysicians to the more sober 
and accurate findings of the field <coughs> biblical archaeologist. Today, in the name of religious history, men are digging with their hands into the earth. They are not following the ancient fathers. They are not regarding the translation of a neglected patriarch as a tremendous contribution to history. They are out in the field trying to find visible, factual evidence of the important, controversial points or trying to fill in the desperate breaks in history relating to religious subjects. Thus, such a discovery as the Dead Sea Scrolls is in the spirit of modern religious history, in the spirit of religious archaeology. A few centuries ago, these scrolls would probably have been relegated to limbo. They would have been forgotten and neglected because they might have interfered with something. They might have changed our opinion. They might have stepped upon the toes of some prevailing orthodoxy. But today, scholars, both from theological seminaries and great colleges and universities of laymen, and belonging to many religious groups, are searching desperately for new and better meaning and stand perfectly prepared to admit that while religion may be a revelation, religious history is not. It is an accumulation and depends upon increasing discovery for its ultimate accuracy. This difference in perspective also points the way to many things that we all should know about. Factually, we are completely ignorant of many of the most interesting episodes in American history. We have accepted certain texts. We have never questioned them. We have thought of the American history as the story of independence. It is not. It is the story of a people striving for independence. And until we discover this, we have not discovered American history. American history is not a problem of trying to whitewash patriots or tear them down. One group is afraid of heroes and the other group is afraid to lose any of them. The facts remain that history is the story of average persons fighting their way toward goals to a degree average but above those previously attained. So with these uh, patterns to consider, let us now approach the historical perspective with which we are concerned this evening. The circumstances, historically, philosophically considered, involving this critical period in the great Phoenix cycle, which we call the beginning of the Christian era. The beginning of an era is always the end of an era. Uh, these two must inevitably come together. Something must cease, decline, or fall away for, from dominance if another factor is to ascend and attain dominance. Just as in the motion of the generations of men, the rulership of the world rests with a generation for perhaps 20 years. Then that generation gradually fades away and rulership passes to another generation. The motion is so imperceptible that we are hardly aware of it. But continuance as we know it is a continual ending and beginning. A continual falling away and a building up a continual process of the creation of a vacuum and then the filling of that vacuum by natural laws flowing in and taking the place of that which has departed. That which departed in the cycle with which we are most concerned was the golden age of Greek culture. 
an age that was distinguished for attainments in science, philosophy, art, music, literature, and letters. An age of extraordinary philosophical illumination. An age which produced perhaps more outstanding creative thinkers than any other recorded era in history. Yet as we pointed out before, this was not a situation that was purely local. For this Phoenix cycle seems to have something to do with a great clock in the universe. For that which was occurring in the Grecian culture was paralleled by extraordinary and important changes in other parts of the world. The rise of Taoism and Confucianism in China. The great Buddhistic reforms in India. The restoration of the Avestic tradition in Persia. These events were paralleling those which were occurring in the Mediterranean area. Now as we go forward 600 years, we see in the Grecian states philosophy deteriorating away under the pressure of great problems of utility. The rise of the Roman Empire disturbed many aspects of man's culture. For one, uh, for in one way, for example, it disturbed leisure. In another, it presented man with one of the first great expo uh, expositions of the problem of the victory of brute force over morality and culture. It forced man to assume that good could not vanquish evil unless good was also stronger than evil stronger in the sense that good was supported by better human beings and more of them than evil. The philosopher could be taken out into the arena and fed to the lions by a despot. The greatest poet could starve to death. The great scholar could live and die neglected. And a comparatively worthless patrician could enjoy all the advantages of living. It was a period of disillusionment in which man was losing faith in the great theoretical concepts which he had concerning the operations of natural law. Theories given opportunity of application were not able to demonstrate their immediate utilities. Socrates was a good and wise man, and he was poisoned by the Athenians as a reward. Aristotle was a great and learned man. He was banished. One by one, those who were devoted to truth found themselves confronted with an adamantine wall of error. They discovered that power was moving gradually into the hands of aristocratic minorities or into militaristic sects. It is the same concept that is described to the philosopher when the king Minos showed him his treasure houses. The philosopher said to the king, you have more gold than anyone in the world, but you will lose it to the first man who has better iron. This was what the classical world was discovering. It was learning by the terrible example of the Roman Empire that what we term materialism was a fact to be reckoned with. That it was not merely the minority conception of a few selfish persons but that it had a tremendous hypnotic power over all people, and that against it only the strongest and the firmest could stand, and they stood alone. 
This decision, this conclusion, might never have come upon Mediterranean culture had it not been that a highly cultured people, the Greeks, were conquered by a comparatively uncultured group, the Romans. The Greeks also had the spectacle of observing that the iron of Rome not only toppled over the altars <coughs> to the philosophic gods of Greece, but also toppled over the altars of a hundred religions. The gods of various cities did not defend them. The Roman phalanx was stronger than heaven. Now observations of this kind forced upon a people which had long existed at least with a comparatively provincial attitude. I will not say a people that had not passed through disasters and mistakes and a certain degree of conquest was important because it uprooted something else that was very strong in the classical mind. Athen Athens could be conquered a thousand times by Macedonia or other nations. But to the Athenians, in their particular pattern, this was punishment. They did not doubt the gods. Punishment made them believe but more firmly in the gods. Because the Athenians, in the privacy of their own convictions, were fully aware of their own delinquencies. And the evil man, with a bad conscience, <laughs> regards defeat usually as punishment. But as the picture grew in proportion, when good and bad, old and new, wise and foolish, all together were trampled under the feet of the Roman legionnaires, it was no longer possible to fall back upon this moralism it became obviously obvious that the world was moving. Moving from a philosophical foundation and a religious foundation to what we might term a scientific economic foundation. The Greeks themselves probably began to understand why this had happened, but they could not check the momentum. For 300 years following the, the zenith of the Periclean period, there had been a gradual division in knowledge. By degrees, knowledge as science was divided from knowledge as religion. Philosophy was held in a kind of abstract aloofness. It was a kind of ancient and wise ancestor. But younger philosophers began to build bridges and roads. They began to seek outlets upon practical levels, and they also became conscious of the need for an economic reward for the various activities. By degrees, state control of religion gave place uh, to private worship, and the advancement of religious and philosophic systems passed into the keeping of individuals. Immediately, of course, they began to fail because the individual was not sufficiently unselfish to support them. All these elements together terminated in a grand disillusionment. A disillusionment which caused philosophy to stand and recite its own obituary over the ashes of a magnificent era an era in which immense progress had been made. But this progress would now pass from its original keepers to those who would use it and abuse it for their own ends. It was no longer possible to control knowledge. It was no longer possible to keep the secrets of higher learning from the corrupt. Any strong man could seize the college or the temple and could, if he so desired, pillage it, destroy it, 
or twist its curriculum or its creed to his own advantage. Egypt reports the same thing. Now let us go to the other side of the world and see what was happening. The beginning of the Christian era marks the end of the philosophic era of Taoism. Approximately the year 40 or 50 AD, Taoism ceased to be a philosophy in China and verged toward a state theology. Your Taoist philosopher, your scholar, the man to whom Taoism meant the personal experience of God through tremendous discipline upon self. This philosopher disappeared almost completely from the descent of the subject. In its place emerged Taoistic theology, very largely derived from certain aspects of indigenous Chinese religion and Buddhist ritualism. We now have the Taoist believer who through prayers and relics believed that he could preserve his own soul. It was now a problem of Taoism carrying the people. It was no longer a problem of a man gradually coming to merit enlightenment, to earn his own salvation. Salvation must come to him easily in ritual, formula, mantra, or through some strange magical means for magic as an escape from labor was always an interesting possibility. At the same time in China, in the first century, within a few years of the beginning of the Christian era, Confucianism was declared to be a state religion. Dividing with Taoism and Buddhism, the spiritual leadership of the Chinese people. What was the result? The great ethical code of Confucius, a very severe code, depending for its validity upon the conscientious conduct of the individual, began to drift into oblivion. Men paid great homage to Confucius. His name became venerated above all other names but they forgot to keep his rules. To merely affirm them, to accept them, to say, I am a Confucianist, was to be in good taste and good style. The rest was ignored. So we see exactly the same situation coming. We find that 600 years of Taoistic and Confucianistic philosophy in China led not to the rise of a great disciplined China, but to the building of countless temples filled with innumerable images, worshipped in part by writing a prayer upon a piece of thin paper, chewing it up and spitting it onto an image. Either Confucius or Lao Tzu would have turned in their graves under such a procedure, yet it represented a change that was to show why China was never able in the classical or ancient period to establish itself upon a solid level of ethical integrity. It was always a country in which the strong pillaged the weak. First in the name of heaven, second in the name of Confucius, and finally, in the name of the Mandarin himself. About this time, we moved to India. What was happening to Buddhism? In precisely 600 years, Buddhism came to its first great crossroad. Philosophic Buddhism, as represented by the original teachings of the great Eastern philosopher, might be said to have comparatively died. 
original Buddhism was nearly extinct in its own homeland. In its place arose the great marvelous era of Buddhistic metaphysics. At this time came the multiplication of images. At this time came the tremendous ritualism of Buddhism and the simple of agnosticism of the original teacher was reflected in a system which developed over 10,000 divinities. Now we must not say that all of this represented loss. Let us rather say that in Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, in the Avestic philosophies of Persia, and in the condition in the Near East at the beginning of the, of the Christian era, the tip was a very distinct motion, tipping from discipline to devotion. In every system, faith came to take precedence over discipline. Most critics have said that discipline was just too difficult. Uh, Hegel has attempted uh, to give us a summary of what he regards as the motions of these elements. And I jotted down a, a few words from Hegel. Hegel attempted to point up uh, the fact that history, in its deepest aspect, is essentially the story of man's spiritual con uh, conviction. He also came to the conclusion that different races, different nations, and different culture groups, although passing through similar periods and cycles, were distinct because of the emphasis which they placed upon the conduct of man. This emphasis becoming the basis of the entire sociological pattern that followed. History was therefore the record of the results of moral emphasis as this affected vast aggregates of human beings and became the basis of the laws under which these human beings lived. In this point, Hegel gives us five keynotes of uh, religions, which he regarded as basic historical factors. He says, for example, that Judaism is the emphasis of duty, that the entire development of this faith and the effect of it upon other peoples and within its own group was the growing, intensifying recognition of the essential fact of duty. <coughs> duty was the great virtue. He then says that the emphasis by Confucius was order. That the purpose of the Confucian code was primarily to preserve absolute order in all relationships and in all processes. That the moment order is endangered, continuity is endangered. Because the moment things get out of pattern or out of arrangement, chaos sets in upon them. Disorder leads to death unless it can be corrected. Perhaps that is why we refer frequently to forms of illness as disorders. If they are allowed to continue in society, disorder becomes the sickness which is mortal, which is finally the disintegrating and destroying fa uh, factor. He gives as the great ethical keynote of Muslimism justice. and emphasizes that upon this concept we can have exactitudes which may go to the excess of injustice.
Yet without justice, the state cannot survive. The individual who is not convinced within himself that he lives within a condition of justice can never maintain or preserve his own morality and ethics. For that reason, the moment a cultural group or a social order becomes delinquent, it accuses its leaders of injustice or exonerates its own by them. Thus, the moment leadership becomes unjust, followers become equally unjust in their relations to each other. And this ultimately destroys the moral ethical fabric of a people. Hegel, in an interesting enough way, gives us the keynote of Buddhism, patience. And he regards patience as the key word to Eastern history. Patience is a very great virtue, unless it leads to inertia. A patient man is not one who is dead, nor one lacking in incentive, or lacking in the imponderables of, of effort. A patient man is one who has learned within himself one undeniable fact namely, that you can hasten nothing beyond its natural speed. Impatience leads to injustice, for it attempts to exaggerate the pace of things, or becomes dissatisfied at the slowness of achievements, or attempts to force that which can only be accomplished by growth from within itself. Thus patience is a great and powerful thing. And history is a valid record of the ultimate victory of patience. Inasmuch as all good things have been of slow maturing, but have consequently endured long. Hegel then gives us, as his final group classification, Christianity as the emphasis upon the concept of love. Now he himself points out that without a sense of duty, without law and order, without justice, and without patience, there can be no love. You cannot have true love apart from all these considerations. Therefore, he is perfectly willing to accept that history is the record of the meeting, dividing, reunion, blending, synthesizing of these great streams. And that what we call modern man has inherited these five great social concepts and that these concepts in some relationship in some pattern either separately or together constitute the impulse which results in history that without these factors man would remain eternally static or would be the victim of such caprices of conduct that the results could never be classified and might be considered to be an this pageantry of incident and accident. Now we said earlier that with Christianity began the basic concept of history for the reason that in Christianity for the first time was clearly enunciated the doctrine that creation and the descent of created things, particularly as outlined in the Old Testament, stood clearly to indicate 
the unfoldment of a divine purpose through a series of connected incidents which must lead ultimately to the regeneration and perfection of creation. Thus we may say for the first time the grand archetype of all occurrence, all incident, all circumstance being part of something. This archetypal vision is found, for example, in the history of Biosibius. Truly, at that time, and later in the uh, historical morality of St. Augustine, <coughs> there was no great attempt to break away from the biblical descent of history. The early church historians were not interested in Egypt, except for the interludes of Joseph and Moses, or perhaps the flight of Jesus into Egypt. Egypt, as itself, was only part of a framework. These same historians had no particular concern for Greek philosophy or Greek history, and as we can tell from studying their works, were totally unaware of the history of the Eastern Hemisphere. They had not accomplished their purpose, but they had advanced the idea that from the hypothetical atom uh, to the latest newborn babe, all generation was tied together in something that it was an unfolding of a divine plan. Today, the modern man will probably resent in some instances this reference to divine plan. But he maintains the same concept when he thinks of history as the sequential unfoldment or evolution of life. For he causes evolution to stand for the progressive development of a plan or a pattern or the gradual unfoldment of life from something through something to something. In this way, the Medes and the Persians are rescued into the life of modern man. The past becomes a valid experience just as we accept in human life that the past is a conditioning factor in our psychological perspective, our philosophical and moral understanding of things. We don't, therefore, throughout the then existing and civilized world, and to a measure there is indication and evidence even in our Western Hemisphere, among the ancient records of the uh, peoples of the Central American area particularly, that about the beginning of the first century there was a tremendous moral, ethical, spiritual upheaval which seems to have occurred primarily inside of man and to have moved him to a comparatively new stage of his own development. We have a parallel for such upheaval which is not explainable historically and becomes an unhistorical fact in the transition, for instance, between childhood and adolescence, or between adolescence and maturity. The individual is affected by his environment, but certain biological processes inevitably release psychological tendencies and these are native to and natural to the unfoldment of man himself as a human being. He must pass through these phases. Some may have a more difficult time than others. Some may find the experience a magnificent adventure, others a dismal and neurotic episode, but still the change must take place and seems to be the same in this problem of history. History is punctuated 
by certain unhistorical events which have to do with the internal life of those creatures growing through history. History defines the boundaries of their achievements, but it cannot completely capture the stages of maturity through which these beings pass. For, trans for the transitional and historical growth stimulate something within man, releasing faculties, powers, and perspectives previously latent. These are then dumped into the historical arena and result in a rapid and amazing change in the historical perspective itself. Thus man made by history reaches a certain point in the making in which he turns and makes history. Then having made history, he falls into the pattern which he himself has created, may become the victim of it, may ultimately become decadent by clinging to pattern, and then after a certain length of time, finds himself again being fashioned by history, rebelling and becoming once more a creator of history. The cycle goes on and on and on. At the beginning of the Christian era, we therefore observe very definitely the four, actually, of Hegel's principles were already functioning, although justice was not at that time primarily associated with Islamism, for well, this came in 600 years later at another critical point. But justice in a sense existed, but not in the sense which it was later to assume or, the, or to produce the results which it was later to produce through the rise of the Muslim world. Because the Muslimism became the justice balance which prevented Western civilization from be passing into a state of complete autocracy. The balance for you was established. But certainly Buddhist patience Judistic duty and Confucian law and order were all available in the experience of man at the beginning of the Christian era. Thus we observe a tremendous change taking place at this particular time. The change was not as the result so much of the Roman mind, because it is doubtful if the Roman gave it any consideration at all. It was the effect of the Roman conduct upon the non-Roman mind of discipline to a kind of disillusionment, a sort of internal despair which found its compensations only in that kind of reflection which arises from pain. Thus man began, became more aware of the sacredness of suffering, the sanctity of sorrow. He was re-experiencing the tribulation of Job. He was reaching out for security in which values that were to him apparently hopelessly lost could be rescued. Such certainly was the state of Syria and the condition of the Jewish people at the time of the beginning of the Christian era. Their sorrow, their misfortune, their tribulation can be traced in such movements as the Essenes, the Therapeutae, the Johnanites and the Nazarenes. Orders of resignation, movements of acceptance of sorrow, movements in which patience had to become important, but it could not be merely the patience of Job. <laughs> 
It had to be patience with hope. Patience with something greater uh, than disillusionment or despair. Thus we had, among many of these peoples, in fact nearly all of them, the rise of a messianic concept. For example, the transformation of Taoism in China was due to the rise of what might have been termed new prophets. A Taoist mystic spearheaded this change. A Confucianist mystic spearheaded the translation of Confucianism from a philosophy to a religion. A Hindu Buddhistic mystic and a group of Arhats were responsible for the change in Buddhism. Persian mystics were the ones who brought about the transition in the cult of Zoroaster. <coughs> And through the Near East, and even through Greece, and to a degree in the Roman Empire, small groups of mystics were the ones to whom, upon whom descended the burden of preserving human hope. Mysticism, psychologically always inver involved in introversion, Mysticism was the natural outlet available to persecuted minorities with who had no hope of the material improvement of their state. Peoples disillusioned completely or nearly so because it seemed that in every way their gods had failed them. The only answer lay in a further reestimation of self, a further emphasis upon the possibility that the individual had failed God. And the moment this becomes strong, we have asceticism. We also have monasticism. And finally, tremendous programs of repentance. Against this first tendency, a balance of factors were also introduced, uh, was also introduced, consisting of the Syrian Gnosis and the Alexandrian Gnosis. Both of these were originally philosophical movements that were almost immediately transformed into mystical movements. The restoration of Platonism in Alexandria was Neoplatonism a mystical interpretation of Plato? Everywhere mysticism, a contemplative solution to the emergency. Mysticism was also a defense mechanism because it was the only way in which the individual could detach himself psychologically from the pressure of his time and retire into values which he regarded as essential to his survival. <clears throat> Thus we see that the very pressure of things brought about a tremendous crisis, a crisis like a motion from childhood to adolescence or a shift from a strongly objective to a strangely disturbed subjective uh, state of existence. Mysticism stepping in therefore required a completely new estimation of eternal values. Mysticism could not attack the chronicle or the animal or such phases of history as did exist. Mysticism could not disprove Plato. It could not disprove Aristotle. Buddhistic mysticism could not disprove Buddha. Nor Taoistic mysticism disprove Lao Tzu. Nor could these mysticisms rise in violent antagonism against the whole common experience of the race. 
This was not conceivable. These mystics would not only have been exterminated, but utterly ridiculed. Had they departed from those things, man had already experienced to be true. So what happened? Mysticism became a new unfoldment, a sequential examination, a penetration into the substance of previous appearances. Thus mysticism became a new explanation for an existing and accepted fact, circumstance, or truth. Your mystic then, whether it be in India or China or in the Near East, stated firmly that he did not come to destroy the prophets, but to fulfill the prophets. Man resolved to build, turned into himself. The moment he did so, he found a new light radiating from himself to his own beliefs. He began reading his own sacred books with the light of his own experience rather than the light of traditional experience. And in this procedure, began to feel that these books had never been truly understood. He gave them new meaning. He gave them new importance. And as his contemplations extended, not only to the literary phases of religion, but to the creedal and doctrinal aspects. This man, with a great need in his own soul, found the light of his own need illuminating even the nature of deity. Perhaps he acknowledged, and perhaps he never knew, the inevitability and immovability of the divine nature. All he knew was that it seemed to him that he had come nearer to a deity whose essential nature was nearer to the human need. This pattern led to these tremendous motions of reformation. A further demonstration of that is, of course, that in the first century, the Roman persecution of the Christians though not perhaps as fantastic as we like to believe from a prejudiced point of view, was certainly severe enough uh, to require great fortitude on the part of early believers. These early believers, however, possessed this fortitude because they had moved from traditional focal points to internal, mystical, personal experiences of the fact of God. Thus the deity that had lived upon the Olympian heights now lived more nearly and more really in the heart of man himself. Confronted with an outside emergency, the person was required to turn to the only strength available and achieve what the Neoplatonists termed the victory of self over circumstance. At the first century, the circumstances were bad, the worst that a highly cultured people had ever known. Therefore, the need for this victory was the strongest and deepest they had ever experienced. And out of the impact of the great need and the growing enlightenment of the people, for they had already enjoyed the great cultural advantages of classical civilization, came a new chemistry, the chemistry of the philosophical type of mind, meeting an emergency which philosophy could not solve, and using its philosophic insight to move on to a spiritual perspective. This type of situation, having been widely disseminated, we must assume to represent a valid step to the natural unfoldment of man. When Hegel, therefore, makes the Christian dispensation uh, the order of human love 
or man's love for man and his respect and affection for deity. He presented the early Christian with a challenge that was perhaps greater than he could bear. Human adolescence has as its essential nature exactly the same thing. For human adolescence is a motion of the individual from the extroversional processes of growth towards a depthening of his internal nature by which he becomes capable of love, whether it be human love or divine love. Therefore, emotional integration is almost certainly an essential part of man's <coughs> growth in love experience. So we have an era in which this experience became first a problem, then a burden, and finally an opportunity for an, for an aggressive and excessive possessiveness in the name of love, which was the exact perversion of the original principle that man himself in his own growth passes through precisely these difficulties. Love moves from mere exuberance of emotion gradually through excesses of one kind or another to the final clarification and purification of itself. And that, to a measure, was the problem that faced these six centuries. And to make this pattern solid, strangely enough, the cycle of the phoenix gave the people precisely 600 years in which to achieve their end. For within this measure is the crest, decline, and fall of the Roman Empire, which had become the shelf or foundation which supported the pattern. By the end of 600 years, Man was tipped from the final decline of the Roman Empire into what we call the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages began approximately 600 AD. And dark is an understatement. So seriously deficient were these periods, which we call the Dark Centuries, that we scarcely have a reliable historical record of them. In this time, literacy declined, travel was forgotten, philosophy was lost, and religion uh, was unable uh, to integrate itself into any uniform, purposeful pattern. So the great opportunity which began with the Christian era literally closed or ended uh, with the reign of Justinian which brought to a theoretical and really factual conclusion the collapse of Roman supremacy. Justinian was one of those who buried Rome. In the very midst of this great 600 year period stands the impressive monument of the Council of Nicaea, convened by Constantine Magnus, paid for by him, presided over by him, and partly recorded by his secretary Eusebius. It is clearly noted that Constantine personally paid the expenses of the delegates including ha handsome maintenance in his palaces and estates while they were present. Probably some of the delegates enjoyed greater luxury than ever before in life, or ever again. But the purpose of the great council was to prepare Europe for the establishment of Christianity as its dominant religion. In the midst of this period also, we begin to see the difficulties arising. For philosophy had not been totally without experience in these things. 
philosophy had always pointed out that there is something more to love than emotion. That there is something more uh, to virtue than good intention. And that there is something more to progress than devotion. With these elements there must also be a sovereignty of common sense. An intellectual maturity by which the individual not only wishes to do well, but knows how to do well. And in the great excitement of the time, this point was seriously neglected. And out of this neglect arose the tragedy which resulted finally in the collapse of this phoenix cycle. For at the end of the 600 years, the average person had not been able to establish love as a practical force within his own life. He had been unable to separate it from selfishness. He had not been adequately moved to educate it. He had not been reminded that emotion without discipline is madness. Therefore, he was a little mad. Of good intention, but hopelessly unfit to meet the challenge. And out of his own unfitness came his own undoing. And his entire purpose was lost when the Dark Ages formed an almost insurmountable barrier, barrier separating one world from another. Rome contributed little to the preservation of anything other than the creedal form of Christianity. Greece gave something in its emphasis upon philosophic mysticism through Neoplatonism and the Gnosis. Egypt gave something in the last aspects of its Osirian rituals and rites. But the great danger and trouble was that the individual was no longer restrained in the attainment of certain knowledge. The barriers of the mysteries had been broken. We may say that this break was inevitable and ultimately absolutely necessary. But coming as it did, it was like maturity breaking upon the child. It results in that kind of a situation which may lead to the most disastrous uh, difficulties, moral and even criminal. The strength of the people under these crises depends largely upon the traditional background and the strength of their moral and cultural discipline. This was further impeded by the fact that the Roman attitude changed the level of human progress, emphasizing more and more the rights of the so-called uh, underprivileged group. So that gradually the underprivileged group became the militant custodian of doctrines which it could not comprehend. All of these things gravitate together and the crisis becomes finally personified. For we discover always in nature that the sorrow of man produces the man of sorrow. That the disaster has within it the inevitable uh, remedy of itself. Emergency must be met, and every emergency produces its heroes. The great emergency converging in these different areas produced outstanding individuals. And in the Near Eastern era and area, this great emergency produced uh, the Christian dispensation and the heroic personalities and leaders of what we know as the apostolic age or the first great circle of devout human beings following after the dispensation which had been established becoming the great evangelists of it many of them persons whose sincerity 
and force of character cannot be denied, but whose abilities were in various ways limited. Perhaps the most articulate spokesman of this period was Paul of Tarsus. Obviously, when you cut, as one of the ancient fables tells us, a sail according to the wind, the ship will travel. And the growth of mysticism, or an intensive simplification of religious procedure, was almost immediate. We can again recognize that religion always flourishes in an emergency. Man finds strength to believe in God when he loses strength to believe in himself. When he is no longer able or believes that he is able uh, to carry the world himself, he returns it with some proper apology to its creator. But while he is getting along well, he is lord of all he surveys. Thus, the great critical period resulted in men turning to religion. Just as today, we have had a magnificent efflorescence of religion following uh, the episode at Hiroshima. Man suddenly discovering an atomic bomb which might threaten his own survival entered into a prayerful mood and will remain so as long as his scientific progress endangers his survival. In this emergency he turns back to his ethics, back to his morality, back to his uh, philosophical institutions. In the Near East, the collapse of the Jewish monarchy was one of the factors which had a great deal to do with the local conditions in Syria at the time of the beginning of the Christian era. Uh, the unit of culture which produced Christianity was in the tremendous state of despair, of complete demoralization. And yet it reviewed the situation and accepted the earliest forms of Christianity merely as reformed Judaism. There is nothing to indicate very clearly that even the early apostles viewed themselves as other than the true Jew. The others had fallen away. Their Christianity was true Judaism, the Judaism restored by contemplation in tragedy and despair. They regarded the founder of Christianity as a learned rabbi, a young but remarkable member of the great Sanhedrin, one who supported his own beliefs and ideas in the most approved manner by frequent reference to and quotation from uh, the great authorities of the Old Testament. This situation uh, resulted in early Christianity taking in relationship to Judaism much the same position that Lutheran, Lutheranism took to Roman Christianity. In other words, it was a reform. <coughs> the way of the reformer is always difficult, and he is not infrequently a martyr because his reform will not be accepted by all, even of his own people. Gradually, however, it appears that Christianity divided as early as the first century. In fact, the division is already traceable in the Gospels themselves. To one group, Christianity had to be the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. This might well be termed the Syrian school, and has been so called. To these people, as is also pointed out in the Gospels, 
uh, the salvation of Israel, the preservation of Israel, the restoration of Israel, was dependent upon the restoration of the throne of David. Hence the effort in the genealogies to indicate that Jesus was descended from the house of David and was indeed a lion of the house of Judah. Also the emphasis found among the apostles, perhaps the emphasis that most swayed Judas Iscariot, the belief that Jesus must be proclaimed historically, dynastically, king of the Jews. Even in this time, even though he affirmed that his kingdom was not of this world, the majority of the persons who followed him in that cycle were undoubtedly convinced that he had come to achieve the restoration of the sovereignty of the state of Judah. Now this situation was of course immediately subjected to another frustration. The martyrdom of Jesus, the scattering of his disciples, led to the inevitable realization that one of two things had to be true. Either he was not the promised Messiah, because he was not crowned with the crown of David, but with a crown of thorns. Or else, there had to be a great and valid meaning beneath his words when he declared that his kingdom was not of this world. There had to be the tremendous transition between the historical Jesus and the mystical Christos or Messiah. That phase of the doctrine which dealt theoretically and even practically with the creation of Christian mysticism and Christian philosophy derived essentially by a blending of Syrian mysticism and Platonic philosophy. This moved into the Greek sphere of influence, perhaps indirectly at least, as a result of the ministration of Paul. And by the year A.D. 50, there were two distinct Christianities already clearly marked. So clearly marked that it would require centuries before these streams could be brought together. And this, the first really great effort to bring them together, arose in the late period of the medieval epoch, probably the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th, to reach its final flowering in such movements as the New England Transcendentalists in the United States. It's a long arc of pattern. But by, as we say, by A.D. 50 and even a little earlier, we had Hellenistic Christianity, which was essentially mystical uh, consolation. The Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we had the Syrian Christianity, which was still attempting uh, to emphasize the Judaistic interpretation of the Christian dispensation. In other words, the Syrian school was moving the faith back into Judaism as a schismatic group, or as a reformed group, hoping sincerely to broaden the foundations of Orthodox Jewish belief. The other group finally broke away entirely from Orthodox Jewish thinking with the result that today St. Paul is regarded as having been responsible uh, for Christianity breaking with the Jewish faith and emerging as a totally independent religion. <coughs> 
This in turn means that our ancestors, our forebears, back in that time, had a choice of their religious direction. One was to unfold the, G the Jewish hierarchical system, and the other was to depart from it totally into a kind of wilderness of internal seeking. Both courses were followed. The earliest effort to reconcile them was probably the Gnosis, but by that time the bitterness between the groups had intensified to the degree that they both turned upon the Gnosis and destroyed that. For when a family feud gets well underway, woe indeed to the arbitrator. You, uh, he will be the victim of both sides. <coughs> Moving westward, the uh, Syrian Christianity <coughs> resulted very largely in the early formation of the Western Church. The Hellenistic branch contributed considerably, traditionally and otherwise, to the Eastern Church and to the final rise of what we call the Greek Orthodox, which also produced a number of other groups, some of them splinters, and others more or less major branches, including the Russian Orthodox, uh, the Armenian, uh, the Bulgarian, the Romanian churches, distinguished almost entirely by national boundaries rather than by essential differences of doctrine. From the time of the Council of Nicaea, in which an effort was made to bring the two groups back again, to the present time they have never officially reconverged. And out of the combination, to a degree, of these two groups arose finally uh, the Anglican Congregation, which became the Church of England. There is quite an involved story here also, but it is not within our present province. Our purpose is to distinguish as far as we can the valid historical factors which resulted in the year of the Christian era becoming the most important time in calculation for probably nearly a half of the living inhabitants of the earth. Not because they are all Christian but because they have come under the influence of it to the degree that it affects their calendars, their dates, their chronologies, and all related matters. This situation, being essentially psychological, it also began to move. The gradual persecution of the early church and the difficulties through which it passed in the anti-Nicene period or that is prior to Nicaea. Anti meaning in this case prior to, not against. This situation also emphasized an intense segregationalism. Uh, the members of the community, not only for defense, but for a certain neurotic need within themselves separated themselves essentially from other groups and became the basis of a religious motion present throughout the descent of Christianity which has been called separatism or uh, the sense that worship means apartness or away from. Probably to a degree this was due to the dangers and the competitive security offered by remote areas this in turn had its psychological influence. It became more or less a faith of secret worship. And man shall worship his God in secret. And the God he worships in secret shall reward him openly. This thought from the Gospels themselves certainly influenced the early forms of the church. In these days, of course, there was no formal priesthood. There was no essential connection between groups. 
And the church consisted of completely isolated ecclesias or assemblies presided over by deacons or by persons appointed from the congregation. There was a period in which uh, revelationism uh, played a part and there were what were called the apocalyptic movements in the early years of the church. The apocalyptic movements dealt with visions, ecstasies, prophecies, appearances, apparitions and phenomena, attempting to prove through various mysterious circumstances the approaching advent or the second coming. Others of these groups went deeper and deeper into their own mystical contemplations, becoming hermits and going back into the desert. Some of these certainly were patterned upon the old Jewish prophets, who were a very remarkable group, completely different from our common idea of prophet, being persons self-illumined, self-appointed, yet generally recognized by others. It's an interesting phenomenon, but all of these things fitted together <coughs> to produce the gradually increasing pressure that certainly ultimately had to be organized. It had to be brought into some kind of a formularization. While this pressure was at variance with the Roman Empire under the pagan emperors, it was held much in abeyance. But after Constantine, there was a general discontinuance of persecution. And by degrees, the church began to fall, becoming, uh, for that period, the church militant, or the church composed of aggressive leaders seeking to broaden the foundation of the religion as a moral and spiritual duty. Thus, from this period on, we have great changes, but let's see what happens somewhere else. In India, particularly, uh, the motion began there, but it moved almost immediately to China. We find the rise of the concept of the Mahayana, or the great vehicle, the ship of salvation. We refer to certain parts of a church as the nave, and this, of course, actually means the ship. Uh, the Mahayana refers to Buddhism as the ship of the doctrine. And in early Christian religious art, the Christian faith is frequently represented as a ship and is often so pictured upon what is called the fisherman's ring or the ring of the papacy. Usually a ship is so represented as the symbol. This ship of the doctrine in India-China had as its primary purpose the broadening of the foundation of human redemption. Salvation was no longer to be the result of a peculiar dispensation available only to those following certain extreme austerities. Salvation was no longer only for the individual who attained righteousness by his own efforts. Salvation was bestowed, or was a common birthright, and the individual could be saved in two ways, either by doing good or by repenting evil. This became a basic element in Mahayana Buddhism. And within 200 years, the deity Kuan Yin, the Buddhist equivalent to the concept of Mary, or the Holy Virgin, had gained tremendous dominance throughout Asia as the symbol of pure motherhood, pure love, and the ultimate forgiveness of sin. For to this deity was given the right 
to make men whole again through repentance. Prayers might then be addressed to this divinity, who was gradually transformed from a male deity of India into a female deity in China, Japan, and Korea. Thus the Mother of Mercy came to take precedence over the silent figure of Buddha seated in meditation. Buddha remained as the great teacher, but men did not approach him directly. They sought rather the solace of the understanding heart, the heart of the great mother. They went as children back to the mother. In China we have very much the same thing, the Taoist divinities began to take on these same aspects. And in Confucianism, love or emotional regard came to be considered more proper than filial devotion based upon the precedence and formalities of the older beliefs. Thus the faith of forgiveness became universally distributed. There is only one possible answer to it, and that is that we are measuring events by the internals of things. Now we might say that if this occurrence of the first century was the only example of this cycle operating, that we were in the presence of a completely miraculous incident, an incident by means of which one important date could be made to stand out as supreme in all history and in all time. We can take this attitude if we wish, but there are certain things which it will not fully explain. One is why it should have simultaneously occurred among entirely different peoples of different beliefs. And the other thing is that this incident should, as far as its essential value is concerned, this representation of an internal motion from one condition to another, this crossing over from a way now past to a way to come, this evidence of a maturing within consciousness, this evidence is repeated periodically. Therefore, we are not in the presence only of one isolated occurrence. We are in the presence of an occurrence that with almost equal intensity occurs every 600 years. Thus, we cannot affirm it to be absolutely unique. But we can affirm with the mystic that it represents a positive growth of consciousness, a step in the great maturing of a creature, a compound being made up of generations, of histories, of cycles, and perhaps even enclosed within the broad pattern of the Eastern concept of rebirth. History comes to these critical focal points and from them moves forward. The great value of Christianity was stated at the beginning of the era. In other words, the cycle begins with the advent of the teacher. And from that advent on, the purity and clarity of the original revelation gradually but relentlessly declined. The same was true 600 years earlier. Uh, when those persons living approximately in the 6th century BC, Confucius, Lao Tzu, Buddha, Zoroaster Spetama, and Pythagoras, they formed the great challenging notes for their own people. And gradually these doctrines also declined until at the end of 600 years they had all reached a critical state of declination. They had all declined to a degree 
in which either reformation must come or extinction was inevitable. Then in this critical moment, a complete revitalization through reinterpretation. This pattern again follows through into the next cycle, where it is approximately 600 years from the beginning of the Christian era to the rise of the Muslim world. And of course it is this subject which has to be our primary consideration in the next of this series. But we'll never for one moment assume that the rise of Muslimism was an isolated phenomenon. It was not. The rise of Muslimism corresponds almost completely with the decline of Christianity as the result of the conflict of the great church councils, the synods. These tremendous council meetings continually pressing conformity and orthodoxy resulted in the continuous restoration of schisms. In other words, every time there was a council, there were more rebels. Every time something was declared to be absolutely essential as an article of faith, somebody said, I don't believe it. If these constant councils had not only come to com some common understanding, or at least had maintained a respectable relationship uh, to contemporary events, there probably would have been no Islamism. For Muhammad distinctly tells us, and the early Muslim historians reiterated, that what Muhammad was attempting to do was to rediscover or restate the twofold doctrine which was, uh, which was the source of his own inspiration. Muhammad unhesitatingly acknowledges that his inspiration is derived from Judaism and Christianity. And that is why he cannot and is not held to be a pagan or a heathen. Muslimism, Judaism, and Christianity are regarded as a group indivisible in essential elements. The reason for Muhammad was the confusion and corruption of the church councils and the definite belief that he had that these councils have betrayed utterly the purposes of the great teacher who founded them. That already a violent and vigorous reform was necessary or the whole world would collapse religiously. Now this, of course, was the attitude of a man in an isolated area, Arabia, but no more isolated and no more provincial than that which was the cradle of Christianity. Muhammad had the advantage of the perspective of what had occurred to another faith. He saw many things with the peculiar clarity of a simple man. He claimed no divinity, but he did claim penetration and insight into things obvious. <coughs> now the effect of this upon the entire ensuing cycle of 600 years is precisely dated. But we may say that without the church councils there would have been no Islam. We might also say that without Islam we might not have been able to preserve the Christian church. These became ultimately interrelated factors, helping each other even though apparently opposing each other. The church, frightened to death over the ascendancy of Muslimism began cleaning its own house and the result was the gradual integration of a united front. In the presence of a common enemy private feuds were relegated to, to obscurity. We cannot say that the axe was completely buried. The handle was left out. 
but for the moment it was convenient to forget the handle. So we follow this arc, this arc of circumstances, the pain, the sorrow, the misery, the disillusionment that led ultimately to the birth pains of a great faith. We follow this faith through its childhood and we discover that like all children it was finally passed from the age of fairy tale, from a strange unreal world uh, seen uh, through parental guidance, a world of legend and lore and fantasy. It had to gradually face very much the happening that occurs to the seven-year-old child when it suddenly goes to school for the first time. Christianity had to go to school when Islam came along. It had to accept its next experience, namely its adjustment to a pattern of non-Christian peoples. It had to begin to explore the vastness of an intellectual universe that extended far beyond. So we find with the rise of Islam this tremendous motion and what? 600 years later this entire motion consummating in the Crusades. The Crusades which changed Europe, Asia and North Africa. The Crusades which destroyed feudalism. The Crusades that gave the world education the Crusades in which both the Muslim and Christian worlds became sadder but wiser. Almost exactly this, day, this uh, date marked the next avatar of the Phoenix. Now the Crusades were not the only thing that happened then because with them came a complete reorientation of the total perspective of man. Thus this phoenix cycle presents these periodic emphases and reminds us that there has to be a growth pushing things from within, a growth that moves upon an approximate cycle of 600 years between each of the major steps which it must take. And that therefore this measures the collective integration of mankind on an ascending series of levels. So next time we have to begin to study the world of Islam, what it meant, what it did to Christendom and for Christendom, and how it began the integration of the great systems of Christian philosophy that were to mark the next era, and so on. Christianity went through every cycle of the Phoenix following its own inception, and must we assume continue to do so. <coughs> so we are not speaking merely of Islam next week. We are speaking of a world focusing our attention upon the crisis that occurred with the advent of Muhammad and how this crisis affected every one of us and still affects us whether we realize it or not. And so I think our time is up and that's the best we can do for tonight if you're going to get your bus.